Please be seated. Our second reading today is from Matthew 3, and it's verses 1 to 11. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt round his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptised by him in the river Jordan. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptising, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as a father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe has been laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptise you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. I'm going to ask Duncan to come and share the word. Do you want me to pray for you? Lord, we praise you and we thank you. We thank you for Duncan's faithful service. We praise you that you're going to give him your words to say. And we thank you for choosing us, your children, to listen to this. Amen. They were, they were funny old days. But today's days are funny old days. You know, there never was the good old days. We just remember things better as we get older. We remember the good stuff and we forget the bad. I always tell people I had a very happy childhood. And I did, except for those times when I did something I shouldn't have done. And my mother dealt with me. Um, she was the kind of mum, she worked in, a, in a, a police station as a secretary before she got married, and um, we reckon it, it rubbed off on her, because she seemed to know everything about everything, and understood all that was going on. You couldn't catch her out. My dad, on the other hand, he was a bit more like me, um, as soft as anything. Um, it was never said, wait till your father comes home. It was my father saying, don't tell your mother about this. But John the Baptist, how can I put it? I think he was a bit more like my mother than my father. The the passage that was read in Isaiah speaks of the coming of the Messiah, but also um, speaks of the Spirit of God upon him. And then we see the fulfillment uh, in Matthew 3 as as John gives more of this announcement that the Messiah is going to come. Isaiah announces hundreds of years before, and John announces now and then. And the people listen. He speaks of this great one who is to come, and as he does, I thought of this poem by um, Marjorie Pickthall. She was uh, born in England. She was, um, as a small child, she went to Canada, and uh, in the early 1900s, she was regarded as perhaps the best Uh, poet that Canada had, but uh, she wrote this 
short poem. I have not walked on common ground, nor drunk of earthly streams. A shining figure, mailed and crowned, moves softly through my dreams. He makes the air so keen and strange, the stars so fiercely bright. The rocks of time, the tides of change, are nothing in his sight. Death lays no shadow on his smile. Life is a race forerun. Look in his face a little while. And life and death are one. She speaks of, of Christ, obviously. Of that shining one. That one who would come and put all things right. And so Isaiah speaks of that and talks about the Spirit who comes upon him and, and who guides him. The life-giving Spirit of God will hover over him. Well, John the Baptist saw that, not in the passage we read, but in another. As he baptizes him, grudgingly saying, you should be baptizing me. The Spirit of God hovering over him. The Spirit that brings wisdom and understanding. The Spirit that gives direction and builds strength. The Spirit that instills knowledge and fear of God. Fear of God will be all his joy and delight. And where will this come? It will come as a green shoot from Jesse's stump and from his roots, a budding branch. Oh, the days of the glory of the kingdom of David and of Solomon, they were long gone. They had sprung from this root of Jesse. They had sprung from this small family that really wasn't that important before David came. And Isaiah says, from that small, humble beginning, something new will come once more. And who will this person be? What will he be like? Well, he will be empowered and enabled and overshadowed by the Spirit of God. The Spirit that brings wisdom, and understanding. Oh, that the wisdom of Jesus. You read his words. You hear the things he has to say, and you just, they strike you as just being so full of wisdom. You hear the questions that are asked and the answers that he gives that you and I, they're the kind of answers that you and I hope we could think of when someone's arguing with us, but we always think about them maybe five o'clock the next morning. And we think, I should have said that. Well, not with him. He was full of wisdom and full of understanding. He knew what was going on. And Isaiah predicts this. He's someone who will know and who will understand. I was talking to a friend in the week about the difference between knowing God's Word and understanding God's Word. And how it's actually perhaps more important to understand it than it is just to know it. But here is someone who knows and who understands. As um, one of the uh, commentators, John Trapp, says, sharpness of judgment is something that Jesus had in smelling out a hypocrite. His sharp nose easily discerneth and is offended with the stinking breath of the hypocrite's rotten lungs, though his words be ever so scented and perfumed with shows of holiness. He sees through the facade. He sees through the religiosity. You've probably read that apparently in this country, um, now less than 50% of people um, claim to be Christian. And I've been, heard people bemoaning it. And the only question I have for people who are bemoaning that are, what planet are you on? What planet are you on? Because just because people claim to be Christians doesn't make them Christians. There was never over 50% of Christians, of people who are Christians in this nation 10 years ago in the census. There were people who put themselves down as of the Christian religion. But there were never over 50%. And there aren't 40-something percent of people in this country Christians now. About 6% of people in the country go to church. And I'm not sure about all of those. We're talking about a living faith, not a facade that gets put on on a Sunday morning. 
or a Sunday evening. And Jesus sees through it all. Fear of God will be his joy and delight. He will be thinking all the time, what does my Father want? What is my Father's will? And even in the moment of Gethsemane in the garden, as he prays alone, he says to his Father, not my will, but yours be done. It was always the Father with him. So what does that mean? What does he do? Well, it says, he won't judge by appearances and won't decide on the basis of hearsay. Have you ever met someone and disliked them from the moment you met them? Before they even opened their mouths? Or perhaps you're better than me. Have you ever judged by appearances? By the way someone looks. Or perhaps the accent they use. Or if you judge someone because of something you heard about them, something that someone else said that's come third or fourth hand, which in, in Christian circles is often called, you know, sharing things for prayer. When actually it's just gossip. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't share things for prayer, but sometimes it's a fine line. Particularly when we share things about people that aren't very nice. But he won't judge by how things appear or by hearsay. No, he's above that. And he's better than that. Actually, he calls us to be as well. He'll judge the needy by what is right and render decisions on earth poor with justice. So he talks about judging, and he doesn't talk about the wicked to begin with. He talks about the needy and the poor. Why? Because he will judge in the right way. Whereas down through the millennia, from the beginning of time, it would seem almost people have judged others by how much they have and think that God must be blessing them and God must approve of them because of all the things they have. And time and time again, God's word speaks against it in the old and in the new. But here is someone who will give justice to the poor. His, his words will bring everyone to old attention. That's what happened with Jesus 600 years later. The ordinary people stopped and listened and heard. And a mere breath from his lips will topple the wicked. And that's why they were so afraid of him. And that's why the great powers of this world are still afraid of Jesus, still afraid of his followers. It's not that his followers are wonderful. It's not that his followers are powerful. It's not that his followers always get everything right. But it's who they're following that the great powers of this world are afraid of. Because one word from him, and they're gone. This is the one who will come. This is the one we wait for. This is the one we wait for as we light our candles and as we decorate our tree, as we prepare to celebrate his coming. He knows. He knows you. He knows me. He understands everything about us. And what will happen what will happen when he comes? What will happen when he rules? The wolf will romp with the lamb, the leopard sleep with the kid, calf and lion will eat from the same trough, and a little child will tend them. A nursing child will crawl over rattlesnake dens, and the toddler stick his hand down the hole of a serpent. Neither animal nor human will hurt or kill on my holy mount. Peace will come when we know God. It's good and it's right that we pray for peace in our world. But as David, David prayed, Dave prayed, it's not always the peace that we're looking for that God will bring. God will bring the peace that he wants to bring. God wants to bring peace in that world outside, but God wants to bring peace in our hearts and in our minds. And God will choose his way to do it. And he chose to send his son to bring peace. And sometimes in order to bring peace, he has to change our lives as well as the lives of the people around us. We need to come to know him. Do you know him? Ah, oh, well, maybe you've heard of him, but do you know him? You see that 
When we talk about Jesus, when we talk about the coming of Jesus, when we talk about the Christian faith, it's not about religion. Religion leads to trouble. Religion leads to division because there's your religion and my religion. And believe me, I come from Northern Ireland. I know about these things. Division comes through religion, through ritual, through doing things the way we're used to and the way we want to, if we really admit it. No, it's not about religion. It's about knowing him. That's where peace comes. That's when peace comes into our hearts and into the hearts of the people around us. You know, I've been away too long from Northern Ireland in one sense to really understand what's still going on. But there are those who claim faith of of various denominations who I hear and see on the radio talking complete and utter nonsense. Telling lies about the, the big bad protocol, as they would term it. Caring nothing about the effect on people's lives. Caring nothing about peace. Stirring up trouble. Talking to terrorists by the back channels and yet claiming to follow Christ. No. What they say isn't true and how they're living isn't true. But you know, it's easy to point a finger at them. What about me and what about you? Can the lion die down with the lamb in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives? Or our lives filled with trouble that actually comes because we don't live like this. It comes because like my fellow countrymen, we insist on our rights and forget our responsibilities. The lion shall lie down with the lamb. Knowing God brings peace. Knowing God brings peace to our hearts that shows in our lives. It's not just some inward spiritual thing. It's, it's real. It's practical. It makes a difference every day. And so John comes. John comes. And then the other set reading for today. John comes <sighs> preaching repentance. John comes saying that the kingdom is at hand. John comes telling the people just as it is. Repent. This is what the the scriptures have been speaking of. He's here. He's coming. Things are going to change. And what happens? The ordinary people, they, they can't believe it, but they do believe it. They hear his words. They hear him telling, look, Someone great is coming and he will have used some of the Old Testament scriptures as he speaks of, as he does in this reading we had read to us. And they follow him. The ordinary everyday people whom some might call the great unwashed in a previous generation. They come and he says, repent. And what do they do? They repent and they get baptized. They find joy in having their sins forgiven. But still they have, they have yet to meet this one who is to come. Still they have to meet him. He's not yet. He's almost there. Well, he's around, but they just don't know it. But they repent. And in the middle of all this, the learned people, the theologians, those who have been faithful to God and the commandments, all the hundreds of the commandments since birth, they would tell themselves. They come to see what's going on. And they see this strange man who's dressed strangely and eats strangely. And I don't imagine a brush went through his hair very often. It certainly wasn't cut. They just came to gulp, really. What does John do? Does he say, oh, isn't it great? Even the religious leaders, even those in power are following now. Even they are listening. Is he really happy? No. Well, guess for yourself. He says, you brood of vipers. 
Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And don't say to yourselves, we are children of Abraham. For God could raise children of Abraham from these stones. I'll take it that that wasn't quite the welcome they were looking for. And I'll take it that John was fairly angry with them. Because, you see, these were people who knew all the rules, who knew all the regulations. And the most important thing for them was to tell everybody else what they were so that they would follow them too. Jesus talks in a later time about them tying people down with their rules and regulations. So, John says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You too need to repent. And I'll tell you what, when I heard the news about the number of people who put on the census Christian, you know what I thought? I thought, good. I thought, good. Because people are starting to be honest. Because you know the people who won't come to faith in Christ. You know the people who won't find reality and relationship with Jesus. It's those who think to themselves, well, I'm a Christian already. No need for me to worry. I do good. I do things the Christian way. And I go to church regularly. Once or twice a year. It's almost like they're vaccinated. It's almost like they're inoculated. And that's what was wrong with the Pharisees. That was wrong with the leaders. That's what was wrong with those in charge. They came to sneer. They came to gawp. They came to hear this man who had suddenly become so famous, but it was nothing to do with them. Wasn't it good, they thought in the beginning at least, wasn't it good that he was talking to these these ordinary people? Because they might come to see how important they were as the religious leaders. But they never find Christ that way. But John said, no, repent. And he says to the religious leaders, produce fruits in accordance with repentance. He says, it's for you too. I knew someone when we lived in Horsey. I remember having a talk with her, and in fact, her, our priest, uh, Graham, was there too. And we were both a bit shocked. She'd been part of the church, I think, most of her life. And she came out with a phrase that sort of haunted me and stuck with me since. She said, but I don't want Jesus to pay the price for my sins. I want to put things right myself. And I'll tell you right there there and then, for all the facade, for all the piety, for all that she was actually quite a nice person, there spoke someone who was not born again, who was not a follower of Jesus Christ, because it begins with repentance. It begins with turning away from our sin and trusting him to forgive us. All that I can do from now until the end of my days or to the Lord return before. All that I could do. All the preaching I can do, all the visiting I can do, all the, the, the wise words, few and far between sometimes, but that I could give to people would not even begin to make up for my sin. I stand here knowing that I am forgiven and knowing that I belong to Christ. Why? Because I'm a good person? No, because I know that I'm not. And that I've given my life to Christ and said, Lord, take it, do with it what you want. And he has. Um, Sometimes I haven't always liked it. But that's all. And he calls me to produce fruit that shows that repentance. And he calls you as well. If you've never put your trust in him, if you've never depended on him, if you've thought to yourself, I've got to work hard and do the best I can and perhaps maybe God will forgive me, I want to tell you you're on the hiding to nothing. But you put your trust in him, ask him for forgiveness because he's promised it. He'll forgive you every time. Ah, but you don't know what I've done. (laughs) Yeah, but tell you, you don't know what I've done. 
But God does. He sees the the whole. And he judges, as it said in Isaiah, not from the appearance or from hearsay, but from what he sees and what he has promised he will do. And all he calls from us to do is, is to truly repent, to begin to walk with him, and he will produce that fruit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As Paul says, against such things there is no law. That's what God calls you and I to. You know what? You can learn your Bible all you like. You can quote all the verses you like, and I'm not against that at all in any way. But let me tell you, there are times when I can't remember where a verse is in the Bible. I have to look it up. I have to scroll through a few times to find things. You know what's more important than knowing where a verse is or even being able to quote what it says? It's to look at that verse, to look at that command of God and say, honestly before God, I am doing what that verse tells me to do. To say honestly before God, with his strength and him enabling, I am walking in that way. That's what matters. I don't care whether you can quote them or not. Can you live them? Can I live them? Yes, we can, by the Spirit of God, that same Spirit that was sent and promised that spirit of wisdom and understanding that God gives to us, that fights against our own natural inclinations and brings us along in his way. Oh, you'll never be perfect, believe me. What is it that Paul says towards the end of his life? Towards the end of his life, this is. The Apostle Paul, the one who wrote all those great books, some of which are reasonably hard to understand. He says... I am among the worst of sinners. Not I was, but I am. Because you know why? He saw his own sin for what it was. The more he loved God, the more that God blessed him, the more he realized how much Christ had suffered as he died on the cross. And how much it was down to him and who he was. Oh, that God would allow us to produce fruit in accordance with repentance. Let God, let God know you. He does already. He will judge you in his own way. You may find that he's sometimes less harsh than you are once you put your trust in him. Know him for yourself. Know that peace that says, whatever's going on around me, whether it's a hole into which a toddler can put their hand, or there might be a nest of vipers, or whatever trouble assails you, know the peace that in the middle of that, he walks with you, and he loves you. And come to repentance if you haven't already. Come to repentance every day. Come to repentance whether you feel like it or not. And allow God to produce in you, in us, that fruit of repentance that is more attractive and more life-changing for those who meet with us day by day than all the programs and all the learning and all the practicing and anything else we could imagine. I once was at a funeral of a man who was, um, he was an ex-Baptist minister, Paul. Um, it was at um, Great Sanford. And uh, we were talking afterwards, there were lots of ministers at it. And one of the ministers who was retired, who I got chatting to, said something profound. He said, He says, Paul's dad and Paul himself. He said, they're the only people I've ever met that you felt cleaner after you talked to them than before. He said, it was like being in the presence of God. 
May that be our experience both in those we meet and in those who meet us. And may God grant us his grace that we might see his glory in this place. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Duncan. Um, thank you, Duncan. So we're going to close with our, our last song, um, technology permitting. <laughs>